Affairs. I'm Christopher Brown. Today in our Alberta Municipalities Roundtable discussion, we'll delve into three crucial topics affecting municipalities in the province of Alberta. First, we'll address water management. Amidst severe drought conditions, a pressing concern has risen for many municipalities around water. Next, we'll examine the aftermaths of Bill 18, 20, and 21, focusing on the regulations that will be implemented around all three bills. And finally, we'll address a major concern for municipalities across the province, infrastructure funding. With aging infrastructure, municipalities face significant upgrades in the coming years, if not sooner. So joining us for today's discussion are esteemed guests from Alberta Municipalities, President Tyler Gandam, Mayor of the Town of Wetaskiwin, and Director Trina Jones, representing Towns East and Mayor of the Town of Legal. Welcome to Municipal Affairs. Mayor Jones, Mayor Gandam, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, Alberta Municipalities is going through somewhat of a summer-spring uh, MLC tour, visiting municipalities across this great province to hear directly from municipal leaders. President Gandam, yourself first. Are you, are you actually surprised at what you're hearing from the municipal leaders across Alberta, or is it sort of what you expected to hear? Mostly of what I expected to hear. Uh, it's been really good to connect with, so far, three different communities. Right now, we've been to Flair, Bonneville, and St. Albert. And so it's been exciting to meet with in a smaller group, some electeds that would maybe otherwise not get a chance to meet with at uh, our fall convention. So it's been really good uh, hearing some of their concerns. And what's interesting is that three pretty different communities have similar similar issues. Um, so again, it's making sure that the voices of our Alberta municipalities are heard because we're not that individual where um, there aren't solutions that will look after a, a good number of the communities that we're serving as our members. What's it mean to collaborate in this type of intimate setting for yourself, Tyler? Because I can imagine getting together with a group of like-minded people who are municipally focused, the collaboration goes a little bit farther beyond than what you can do over Zoom or what you can do over virtual meetings like we're doing today. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it also gives the opportunity for maybe some newer electeds, uh, whether this is their first or maybe second term the opportunity to sit in the same room as other elected officials who might have a little bit more experience or might have experience in things that are coming up as issues in their communities to be able to talk through and work about or walk through and talk about um, some of the issues that maybe a community has faced. And then you get some face-to-face -face time with that member to hear about what they did, maybe what they would do differently and learn from their experiences. So it's been a really good opportunity for us to sit down and talk uh, in settings of maybe 30 to 50 people and we get the most of the day with them and eat lunch with them so it turns out really good mayor jones from your perspective what are you hearing when you attend these meetings or if you have attended these meetings what is the common theme that you're taking away that can help smaller communities like legal and get sort of best practices from larger communities that you might not be able to talk to at larger events like the alberta municipal municipalities convention that is expected to happen in red deer well, I attended uh, Bonneville, Flair, and St. Albert as well. Uh, this week, I get to go to Innisfail. And uh, in my directorship, <laughs> I get the honor of representing uh, Bonneville and Innisfail. So it's a real treat for me to get be able to hit those two towns, especially in a more comfortable setting. We're in a little smaller crowd. You get to sit down and have a cup of coffee. Uh, as far as issues, you know, we're hearing the same things across the province. There's funding issues, uh, there's the new legislation, there's infrastructure. That, so we may be, uh, you know, a small community of 13 to 1400, but we're going to have these same concerns as somebody like St. Albert, who is, you know, the scale of things is a little different, but uh, you're hearing the same thing right across the province. Has water been coming up a lot lately? Because I know earlier this year, the provincial government alongside municipalities was trying to make uh, water with the severe drought conditions that we might have seen a big uh, issue for Albertans to consider going into the hotter season. Uh, when you're speaking to members across Alberta in these MLC meetings, is water coming up a lot, Trina? 
Uh, absolutely. Um, usually we hear about it in the southern half of the province with, with the droughts and not quite enough and irrigation. Um, but a story I heard up in Folair, there, uh, the river up there was so low that any debris, trees, uh, and vegetation that had come down the river actually blocked their water intake for their community. So it, it collapsed it. Uh, so they've had to put in a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort into clearing that up so their people can actually have water. And, you know, we've all heard about Calgary, <laughs> but uh, we're... Uh, this year, it, it's become a very acute issue for a lot of municipalities that have never had to really have this issue before. Tyler, what can Alberta municipalities do, particularly at the mayor and council level, to address these issues around water management and potential drought conditions that traditionally, as uh, Trina just said, is more common theme down south, but it seems to be more prevalent across the entire province, not just in southern Alberta anymore? I think a big part of that is the best practices. What are other communities who have to deal with the possibility of water shortages? What are they doing to conserve that? And what's the messaging going out to their community members so that they understand the impact and how important it is that we do take these steps to ensure that our water conservation is high? It's it's really difficult, especially when you see something like what happens in Calgary, where uh, a, a large two meter diameter water supply line uh, suddenly becomes <laughs> broken uh, and and they're struggling to maintain their reservoir levels. And the, the city then as a whole, over a million people, are forced to look at some water conservation measures that maybe they aren't familiar, familiar with or that they don't understand why they have to do it because maybe their line isn't affected like somebody else's is in a different part of the city. And it comes down to making sure that as a whole, depending on the size of your community, whether it's a couple of hundred or over a million people, how important that is and what the cause could be uh, if that water line were to collapse and it loses pressure and the impact it'll have on the rest of the city. So making sure that people have all of the information, they've got those be best practices and have the opportunity to learn that communication from other communities that have a lot more experience with that. Just on that note, because you both represent, you are both mayors of your own individual communities, what best practices have you implemented in your own communities that other municipalities can look at and say, well, Tasquin's doing that, Legal's doing that, maybe we should sort of piggyback on what they're doing to bring it into our community to ensure that our residents understand that water management is a thing that we all need to be taking seriously. But Tyler, for yourself? I don't think we're doing anything extraordinary. I think alternating watering days on even days, you know, the even number of address would and odd days, the odd number would, uh, making sure that lines, like your toilets aren't continuously running, you're not leaving taps on, uh, your shower doesn't take you 20 minutes to get to temperature so that you can get in and feel comfortable. Little things like that go a long way. And I think you would be surprised at how much waste there is in water that we have in our own lives at home uh, and just making sure that you're cognizant of the impact that that has, especially when you get into a situation where you are in a water water shortage or drought conditions. Green up for Legal, is there something that you're doing locally on the ground that you have talked to other municipal leaders from across Northern or across Alberta to say, this is what you're doing? Potentially it's a solution to help you. I think the same thing as Tyler, um, you know, those standard conservation practices, we've tried to really educate our residents that these are a thing and they can help us. They keep our resident or reservoir level good, but they also decrease your water bills. Uh, a few years ago, we instituted a uh, water barrel program. Uh, so the municipality buys them, we sell them back to our residents. Uh, in the last two years, we've seen a, a bigger uptake, obviously, because you know we've been pushing that as a conservation method. Um, and then, you know, just making sure that you're not being extravagant in your water usage. So it, it's, it's kind of a standard message, but the residents are really taking up on it right now. So I, I hate to pick on Calgary, but as the Calgarian show, I've got to sort of pick on them a little bit. And I've got to ask from your perspective, when this water line bro broke and it caused some water issues, water management issues for the city of Calgary, 
there's a lot of misinformation that gets spread around social media. How important is it to combat that misinformation when you see it online from a municipal perspective? Because I saw, and I'm assuming if I saw, numerous other people saw, people would be out there watering their grass because we don't believe what the city's telling us. So when it comes to water management, it's one priority. But the other thing is, how do you combat the people who don't want to actually follow through on preserving our water supply. Tyler, do you want to take that? I think it comes down to trust, uh, making sure your residents trust what it is that you're saying. And if you've built that relationship, something like this, uh, when, when you're in the middle of a crisis, people aren't second guessing what your messaging is. And I think that it would be more than a full-time job in a big city like that. In a city my size of 13,000 people, if I've got people sharing this information on social media, it's it's almost impossible to stay on top of it and make sure that the right information is going out. But it comes down to you being a trusted source. So I've got a mayor's Facebook page. Uh, you can come on there and ask questions or send me a message if you'd like and I can get you the information. Or we've got a city Facebook page as well that puts out information regularly. And so if you've become a trusted source, then that's where people should be going for the information, not the gossip and on the rant and rave pages. Although that does make for a better story that aliens came down and have been siphoning off water from Calgary and they don't have like, absolutely. Oh, if you haven't heard, heard a it story all. by noon, you make one up. Absolutely. So yeah, be a trusted source. Um, and you can try to combat some of that mis misinformation, but you'll never be able to keep up with the stories that people are able to fabricate. We, we talk about regional management. We talk about management of water in general, but how important is it to also take a regional approach to water management? Because your counties, your other municipal mayors who are surrounding you rely on the same water supply that you as a mayor, your residents rely on. So for you, Trina, how important is it to work uh, in a regional uh, collabor collaborative approach to water management instead of just a my way or highway approach? Well, we've been working regionally for as long as I can remember. Uh, our water has been coming from EPCOR for our, oh, 20 something years. Um, so, you know, more in Bell Sturgeon and of course us, you know, we have that water line. We've been working together for a very long time on it. And when, you know, Edmonton had their shortage a few months back, uh, it became a very big regional issue where the communication was key. You know, we're putting out the same information as Bon Accord, but they're not on the same line, but they still get it from Epicor, you know, for Saskatchewan. It became an all of us kind of thing. So the same messaging that everybody else is trying to put out about conserving water, you know, don't water this, take shorter showers. All of the messaging had to be the same, not only to, you know, get people to do it, but to, so to as a, to the earlier point, that misinformation can't get started because we're all on the same page on it. For you, Tyler, because uh, Taskwin's in, a, I don't want to say unique position because it's not uh, as unique as other municipalities. You have a First Nations community as long with a county community that you work alongside to address many issues. Do you work with First Nations communities on the issue of water to ensure that everyone has equitable access to the water management or the water supply that everyone needs? We're both under, or we're under different supplies. So we take out of Coal Lake, which is east of town. Uh, and most of Muskogee's is either on well water or very, very limited ability to, to connect to water, a water source. So uh, we would absolutely be a part of that conversation on water conservation, especially in a drought condition. But um, I think through Alberta municipalities, the way that we are able to work with smaller communities is, again, just sharing those best practices, making sure they're getting all the information with those water usage licenses that uh, we can continue on um, negotiating with, uh, making sure that everybody has that information. And I think that's one of the important things that we can offer our members is, is they're maybe not physically sitting at the table with those negotiations, but certainly there and their best interests are being looked after. This last sitting of the Legislative Assembly was quite busy for the provincial government and in regards to the municipal realm and municipal governance. I've never heard the words uh, creatures of the province more often than I have in the last six months than I did over the last six months. So 
for Alberta municipalities, Tyler, we'll start with you as president, as the official spokesperson. Was this a wake up call to try to figure out how to collaborate with a provincial government who seemed destined to try to steam streamline municipal governance? I don't think this is a wake up call for us at all. I think we've been looking to be a, a good partner with the province um, for as long as I've been on the board. And I know that previous board members and boards have done the same thing, wanting to be a partner, wanting to share our expertise of municipalities with the provincial government. And we didn't do anything different this time, except for the fact that we were a lot more assertive in our opposition to what Bill 20 looked like for municipalities. Um, it, uh, it was maybe a wake up call for the province in terms of how much opposition can be garnered on something that a thoughtful consultation process wasn't taken into consideration. Um, there was a lot more than just municipally elected or municipalities um, asking questions, looking for consultation on what Bill 20 looks like and how it's going to affect their communities. Because the regular Joe and Jane citizen were, were reaching out and finding out how they could be a part of that conversation and how they could get their points across as well. So I'm hoping that following that campaign um, to try to work through some of what Bill 20 is, uh, and then our, our ability to meet with the Premier and Minister McIver, they've assured us that moving forward when there's legislation that has that kind of impact on municipalities, uh, there would be consultation before the legislation is passed. So we would likely get to sit down with them between uh, the first and second reading uh, to maybe give them some insight on what those unintended consequences are so while Bill 20 wasn't fantastic in our way to, to maybe get our concerns across, uh, we've definitely had the door open in terms of future legislation, as well as helping shape what those regulations look like for Bill 20. So I'm cautiously optimistic that we're going to have that impact moving forward. Can I ask you about those regulation talks? Because I can imagine, because if from what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong here, Tyler, but June 4th, you met with Minister McIver and Premier Smith alongside members of Alberta municipalities. Have you had an initial conversation with anyone from the provincial government around the regulations that go alongside not just Bill 20, but Bill 18, Bill 21, with regards to what it may do to municipalities? Not a direct conversation, but we've definitely sent our feedback on what those regulations could look like and how it would lessen the impact on municipalities. Um, so again, we've been assured that we're going to be a part of those conversations. The Premier is going to has uh, agreed to meet with us after our fall convention as well to talk about what our our members' highest priorities are, maybe some work on some of the resolutions that we pass, and just keeping that line of communication open. So I'm... I'm looking forward to that, absolutely. We we always try to bring everything back to local. How does Bill 20 actually affect your municipalities? Is there a concrete thing in Bill 20 that you can look at and you say, this is going to impact us, whether it be financially, uh, policy-wise? For you, Trina, is there something in Bill 20 that you look at and you say, I, this is going to impact my taxpayers at the end of the day? I think the first thing that jumped out at me was the um online or uh you know virtual attendance at public hearings I mean, we don't have a lot of public hearings but we are not currently set up uh to have people come in virtually we don't stream our meetings yet so we're gonna have to figure that out um and i'm hearing the same thing from a lot of smaller communities as well who, who it's just not been a thing yet um so we've we've heard different tactics about what people can do, uh, whether it's a phone line or uh, I've heard Facebook Live, but I've also been told that that doesn't quite meet their requirements. So I think that was the first thing that jumped out at me and, and a number of other small communities. Um, I guess the, the biggest impact one that I thought was, you know, cabinet being able to disqualify counselors or change bylaws. And if you're, you know, putting in a, let's call it, let's say cat bylaw or something like that. And the province decides that, well, they really like cats, so you can't do that. That was a big change that we thought was a little bit of overstep. And we'll, we'll see how that one falls out <laughs> next time. But yeah, just, it, just... It, 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 it... go ahead. 
Oh, sorry. It, it's mostly the, the impact on, on small communities on the financial side that we're a little bit concerned about. Well, just on that point alone, municipal leaders like yourself, I can imagine, are all about transparency. You want people to be engaged in your day-to-day -day lives. This is a step, but there comes a financial step. Has the province reached out to you? Has your local MLAs reached out to you and said the province is willing to pick up that tab of implementing a live streaming service? Because when I implemented one up in Northern Alberta for the municipality I was working for, they were not cheap. And that was about six years ago. And I can imagine things have gotten more expensive since time started. So have you had talks with your local MLA or even someone in the government to say, how are we going to pay for this? Or is it just at the whim of the municipality to implement a service that we don't know what is going to be required to implement? So far, the only thing that we've been told that a municipality will be uh, compensated for is if they've entered into an agreement especially with the voting tabulators. So if there's something that has tied that municipality to that contract, the province would likely step in and offer some kind of compensation. But for nothing else, any impacts of Bill 20 to any municipality will likely be on the backs of that municipality and its ratepayers. So no, no compensation. Thank you. So during your MLC uh, conferences, which you're holding across the province, are you hearing about the regulations that mayors and councillors would love to see implemented into these bills? Are these a topic of discussion around the, the table at these uh, con congresses? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously the, the big one, I think, is the political parties and the municipal level. And understanding that it is only a pilot project for Edmonton and Calgary, it, it is not going, I don't think it's going to go away. I think it's something that's going to be implemented um, throughout the rest of the province. And of course, that's speculation. So take it for what it's worth. But I think that it has an impact on democracy. Um, there's lots of times that the provincial government don't get along on something because two parties uh, fundamentally don't agree on something. Whereas in council chambers at the municipal level, that's not the case. It isn't a partisan issue to talk about snow clearing and road repairs and overlays and building a playground or a new arena. Um, the only time that it gets into that partisanship is when we start having to deal with things that are in a provincial mandate. So homelessness, social needs, mental health addictions, health care. Uh, we've got municipalities right now that are spending money on attraction and retention of doctors because they aren't getting that support. Uh, so I think that one of the nicest things about municipal government is that we're the closest to the people, nonpartisan, and we get to build our community the way that our residents want them to, to be built. And we've got over 330 municipalities across the province. Uh, while each one is different and unique, uh, I think it's really important that we recognize the work that these local electeds are doing and not based on a party system. And yes, of course, you could have parties before, you could have slates before, but it changes when it's on the ballot and you start turning things into a partisan issue and not a local issue. Just on that note. So, uh, sorry, that was part of the MLC stuff. Um, there, I mean, obviously there's some concerns about um, declaring a conflict of interest. As it stands right now, when you declare a pecuniary interest, it's clear, it's black and white. There's no deviation. It's It's set up right there. You know what you need to declare and what you don't. If I declare that I've got a conflict, I could have any number of any reason. And one of those reasons could be, well, this is a pretty contentious, um, this is a pretty contentious motion that I don't want to be a part of. And if I'm one of seven and three other people decide the same thing, they don't want to be a part of it. All of a sudden we don't have quorum. So we start running into issues of how a municipality is going to govern, which at its base is, is all we need to do, govern at a local level. Just on that note, I just wanted to, I, I know I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to hearken back to the premier often said that uh, Quebec has it, uh, Vancouver has political parties. I actually just spoke to a councillor from Quebec City who is in a political party and he comes on the show literally the day after this is being recorded and he told me on the record that he wishes that uh, Quebec never introduced them because they have been the worst thing to be introduced into Quebec politics and that he hopes Alberta municipalities continues their fight against this introduction because he sees no good thing coming from it. So there's my little side tangent for you. I apologize for that. I want to talk and we're about- not, We're not hearing a lot. We're not hearing a lot of the advantages of, of running with a political party. 
Uh, some of the reasons would be to increase voter turnout, um, transparency in terms of who you're voting for. But I think it's pretty clear right now, again, who's building their community and who wants what out of their community. And if that aligns with you fundamentally on what your community looks like, it doesn't matter whether there's a blue sticker or an orange sticker beside their name, not at a local level. And again, so if voter turnout goes from, I don't know, anywhere from 22 to 33% all of a sudden up to 50% because we've introduced political parties at the local level, then maybe that's something that we need to look at and figure out how we can increase that. But just it that alone is, in my mind, not a reason to get into political parties. If you didn't know where Mayor Sohi aligned before you got into that municipal election, uh, that's probably a little bit more on you than it is on the system and how we're electing our officials. Was a quote if I've ever heard one. <laughs> Mayor Jones, for yourself, from a smaller community's perspective, the implications of Bill 20 could be potential, they could have ramifications, not this election, but in the election year 2020. I'm just trying to do my basic math here. Four years plus 2029 20, is the next municipal election after the 2025 one. Do you hear from people in Legal that they want the introductions of political parties at the local level? Because I went to a, a launch of a political party here in Calgary. I would, I hate to say it out loud, but I'm going to. About 10 people I spoke to didn't realize that it was a political party for a municipal level. They thought they were launching a political party provincially. And when they found out it was municipally, they walked out of the room. So for you, do you get a sense in Legal that people want political parties in smaller communities? No, the conversations I've had, I've heard everything from it's ridiculous to uh, much stronger language. Let me put it that way for uh, public content. Um, in a smaller community, it, it, there's no need. We all know kind of where we stand. We all know how we feel about the arena or the potholes or, or whatever. And I don't think it's gonna be any benefit whatsoever. I think what we will see is when it comes into Calgary and Edmonton, because we, are, we aren't that far from Edmonton, we're gonna see a trickle down effect of that political rhetoric and it filtering into our chamber, maybe not through the councillors, but through the public. And I think it, it's gonna create some divisiveness in the community. Um, and it, it, that's that's gonna be frustrating because the five of us, we're there, we, we love our town. We, we have no interest in trying to figure out who's whatever party, it, it, it doesn't matter to us, but we, uh, we are gonna see that trickle down. The best quote I ever heard was from the Weyburn counselor, Jeff Richards, who said, I'm not team one, team B, I'm team Weyburn. And it's true for municipalities, right? You're not on any political side. You're for your team of your community. And I've always thought that was the best line. So uh, Jeff Richards, if you're listening to this, thank you for that quote. <laughs> and, I and wanna... Thank you, because I'll probably oh, use that as well. <laughs> exactly. It's not been stolen. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Best things about municipalities. They always steal from the best, right? We never write our own bylaws. That's what I've heard. Um, I want to turn to my last. <laughs> there you go. Best practices is the best line. I want to turn to my last uh, topic, and it's a big one. Because we see here in Calgary what happens when you don't properly fund municipalities to deal with aging infrastructure. We have uh, Albert, Calgary is currently on week three three, if I'm not mistaken, if I could do my basic math here, four, if you're watching this at a later date, of uh, reduced consumption of water. Calgary is not alone. We saw this in Wainwright with a pipeline, a water main break as well, where they had to conserve water. We're seeing this down in Milk River, where a flood has taken place and it's washed out a basin, which has caused some water issues down in that area. Um, Alberta municipalities has been sounding this alarm since I've started talking about municipal issues, and that was probably back in 2023 with the provincial election. Do you get a sense that the provincial government is willing to come to the table to talk about more adequate funding for infrastructure projects so it's not being done on the backs of municipalities? Tyler. Um, no, I don't think that they're coming to the table with a check, um, check in hand to look after that infrastructure deficit. Uh, we've got, we've estimated that Alberta's got about a $30 billion infrastructure deficit. Uh, I can speak to a taskman who has about a $100 million infrastructure deficit. And we've gone from 
almost 15 years ago, where we put 3.7% of the provincial funding back into infrastructure, or $420 per resident, down to 1%, and about $186 per resident. So Alberta's grown. Um, the amount of money that the province takes in has grown, and yet the amount of money that comes back into infrastructure has decreased, which is then putting that back into municipalities and having them uh, fund those major projects. And I think that we're going to continue to see tax rates increase in municipalities because the tax rate at the provincial level is in keeping up with the needs of the province. So if we're going to talk about provincial priorities, infrastructure is definitely one of them. Can I, can I challenge you on that for a second? Yep. There will be a minister who might watch this and say, infrastructure is your responsibility. Maybe if you stop funding things that are outside your jurisdiction, you, maybe you'll be able to afford to put money into your infrastructure projects. I'm not saying that in particular. I'm just saying that I've nope. heard that from some conservative-minded, UCP-minded people. And that's that's absolutely fair. So I look at how much money we're task when put into homelessness, uh, mental health and addictions over the last five years that we've been addressing it. I look at how many millions of dollars that the city of Edmonton or the city of Calgary or the city of Grand Prairie has put into it. Spruce Grove now is starting to work on some of those social needs. So I'll bet you there would be a lot more money that could go into infrastructure if they weren't addressing social needs. I look at the town of Sylvan Lake who are expending quite a bit of money on attraction and retention for their local doctors. Again, lots of that money could be going back into infrastructure in their town and not having to deal with um, things outside a municipality's mandate and what they're required to look after. So I would be willing to have that conversation all day long if we're going to start looking after what each order of government is to be looking after there could definitely be a conversation on how much more money municipalities could put into infrastructure as opposed to the social needs that we are putting it into do you agree with that mayor jones 100 uh, percent. we've got towns that are putting uh, money into fcss over and above what they technically should be to tackle issues that aren't their problem uh well okay they are their problem they're not their jurisdiction um Tyler touched on the doctor retention. We've put money into bringing in a doctor, you know, giving them space, giving them internet, giving, you know, pretty much everything we can, but it's not our jurisdiction. We would love for the province to take up that issue. And then, then we could put money, more money into other aspects of our community. Devil's advocate time again, because I've had you both on the show and I've asked you this question directly. The resident doesn't care, though. The resident doesn't care what your jurisdiction is or what your jurisdiction is or what the provincial jurisdiction is. They want you, because you are the closest to them, to solve that issue for them. How do you solve an issue like infrastructure funding without telling your residents, we're going to have to increase your taxes 10% because the province and the federal government isn't coming to the table? They're not going to take that lightly. No, it's, it's communication. It's communication and making sure that our residents understand and we educate them on what are municipal issues, what are provincial issues, and what are federal issues. And then we start working back from there. What are our priorities in the community? Um, is it recreation? Do we need trails? Are our roads falling apart? Uh, or is it all of the above? And we need to start picking things these things off one at a time. But Alberta, Alberta municipalities will continue to advocate on behalf of its 270-ish members to increase that funding pot with LGFF. We think that the formula works out pretty good. Um, it helps a lot of those municipalities needs in terms of that infrastructure funding, but it's over a billion dollars short in terms of what that funding pot should be. And I think that changes the dynamics of many municipalities across the province. And we can start addressing that $30 billion, um, that $30 billion deficit, infrastructure deficit. But we've all heard Minister McIver say, and I'm going to try and quote him without officially quoting him, that you're now getting a predictable funding source. LGFF is now predictable. Next year, you know what you're going to get. The year after, it's going to be a little bit less. And that's his words. It, he's saying it's going to go down in 2027, but it's tied to royal uh, resource royalties. So how do you ask for more when they're saying it's predictable? Mayor Jones? It's going to be predictable. Yes, totally agree on that. But it's never been adequate. As Tyler mentioned, the deficit that we're looking into, and if we're looking strictly per capita basis, it's gone from over $400 per person down to $168 per person over the last 10 years. 
to be able to keep up with growth, to be able to keep up with infrastructure, the extra funding programs, we need that amount increased, not just now, but in the future. We're getting, it's going to take us about 20 years to get back to that level if, if we keep sitting at, you know, at the level that the province has set for us right now. So I think we really need to push that message at the province and we need to educate our, our residents and say, hey, yes, this piece is our responsibility. The sewer line to the school is our responsibility. The school is the province. So if you want that school, you have to talk to them. We can't you know, build it for you. So I think it's really telling our residents, yeah, we, we want this stuff too, but we need to, you need, we need you to help us and we need us to educate them. So how do you do that, Tyler? How do you educate your residents? Because Bill 20 seemed to galvanize the entire province. It seemed to be an issue that a lot of people were able to grasp and they were able to get behind, whether before or against it, with the majority, I would say, against it. How do you galvanize the, the, the I don't want to say average, how do you uh, galvanize Albertans to come together to say, okay, the province needs to step up and adequately fund municipalities so that way they aren't left holding the sort of proverbial bag when a water main breaks and it causes a major disruption in a major city or in a smaller community like Wainwright. I think, again, it comes down to education. And fortunately for all of Albertans, Alberta municipalities is going to be doing a bunch of research on how much money has come into the province, taxes, um, the amount of growth we've seen over the last 10, 15 years, how much property tax you pay, how much property tax you pay compared to your provincial uh, income tax, um, and the school tax requisition that the cities or the municipalities collect on behalf of the province too, and laying it out for everybody to say, look, this is what your tax dollars go to municipally, and this is what your tax dollars go to provincially. This is how much they've increased over the last 15, 10, 15 years provincially. And this is the, um, these are the cuts or the downloading that municipalities are facing now. And here's the reason why your property taxes are increasing when we're trying to play catch up on a lot of this infrastructure and infrastructure is just a small piece of the, the services that municipalities provide. So when we're not getting the same kind of funding we were 10 or 15 years ago, the only way we can change that is to lower our level, lower our level of service or increase taxes. And for the most part, people aren't willing to do with less. And so property taxes go up. And then we hear the complaints that property taxes have gone up. Um, but we continue to operate and make sure that we maintain those levels of service. We have a we have a pretty high level of service expectation in Alberta, and I think that's one of the reasons that we are um, why we're growing so quickly. Uh, we've definitely got some advantages here, and income taxes is, is definitely part of it. But with that, we need to have those communities ready for that growth, and infrastructure is a big part of that. And so when we're offering these kinds of benefits to living in the province, the Alberta advantage, then it needs to be full heart and like full partnership between us and the province in terms of how we create communities that best attract these people coming to Alberta, because you'll see that impact immediately in terms of um, income tax revenue to the province. You don't see that with a municipality. FCM had done a study and it cost about $107,000 to bring a new house online in a community it takes an awful long time for those property taxes to pay for that investment there. And your developer isn't paying for all of that. So there's a mix between the municipality, there should be a mix or compensation from the province, as well as the developer to make sure that we have we grow healthy and we grow in a controlled way. Just building a bunch of houses is only going to make us look and not be a, a great province with communities that are falling apart in 20 or 30 years because we didn't have the the financial backing and the aid or the the reserve set up to look after that infrastructure when it starts to fail in 20 or 30 years. So we got to look at this long term as well as how are we going to to build these communities so that we are attractive to other not even Canadians internationally. How are we attracting them here? Some might say that the water main break in Calgary was serendipitous because it coincided with the FCM conference. So mayors, councillors, Reeves from across this great country got together and then we weren't able to use water. So 
one thing I heard at that convention was we're going to go back after this convention and ask our teams to look at our asset management program to truly understand where we are deaf, where there's a deficit in potential aging infrastructure, or there's a major issue that could come up and we could be ready for it. For you both locally, did you go back and have that conversation as well? Or have you heard people start seriously considering what they need to do municipally to ensure that what happened in Calgary doesn't happen in their community? Trina? It was a huge conversation in Calgary, obviously. Um, you know, of course, there was the jokes about, you know, I can't have a shower, I can't do this, you know, and, but you know, the jokes aside, there was always that follow-up going, I don't know what my water lines are doing. I don't know what our plan is, you know? So there was a lot of talk about what kind of assessments we can do. Should we do cameraing? You know, how do we work that into our plans? I talked to a lot of municipalities who barely have a GIS system to map their utilities, let alone an asset management strategy. So I think that's going to be a huge conversation across the country because they all witnessed it in the next year or so. So we're going to have to, it, that's, I think this is the beginning of a bigger conversation. <laughs> Tyler, what about yourself? I can imagine as president of Alberta municipalities, you probably heard from a lot of people on the ground at FCM about what's going on in Alberta, but also around this water main break for you. Have you had follow-up conversations with any mayors or councillors from across Alberta to say, what happened in Alberta or what happened in Calgary could happen in my community. So I need to start sort of smartening up and start looking at what the age of our infrastructure underground is. So that way it doesn't happen here. I think with the size of my community. So we started CCTV um, work within our underground infrastructure a few years ago. And at the time it was a tough sell to our residents to say, listen, it's going to cost us a few hundred thousand dollars. Um, this is what we're going to do. And of course, it's not exciting. It's not, it's not the fun things like a new fire truck or a rec facility, but Calgary shows how important that ongoing maintenance is and knowing what you've got for your assets and how you're managing that. Um, I think many municipalities are going to go back and look at that and say, maybe this is something that we need to start doing too. I think anything smaller than what Tasquin probably doesn't have the ability to get into that CCTV, um, and I don't think that there are many bigger than us that aren't doing that, but they might take a, a different approach to it now where it's like, okay, we need to up our game to make sure that something like this doesn't happen. One of the Calgary councillors asked me last week at our board meeting if we had extra extra pipe to fix a re fix or replace something like that if it were to happen here. And I'm, I don't think we would. I don't have a two meter pipe for sure, but... Do we have that infrastructure in place if we need to replace it? And I don't think that we do. And I think it's something that more municipalities should be looking at so that if you do have one of those emergencies, you're able to, to repair it a lot quicker. I know some of that piping came up from California for um, for Calgary. And that's a long way away to wait. And they still, st they still have to um, do some work to that pipe to be able to put it in place too. So all of a sudden you're on a month, month, month and a half long um, water restriction, waiting for your infrastructure to be repaired. And so I think a little bit of foresight and making sure you've got those things in place might help out. And it, it seems a little redundant. And again, it's not exciting to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to have some stock in place, but it might save you months of, of a headache like this in Calgary. Um, before we let you go, I have a few questions that I want to throw at you and I did not prepare you for this. So hopefully you're okay with taking some off the cuff questions. And it's about some things that have been going on recently, just over the last literally few days on Sunday, June 23rd, Nahid Nenshi, former mayor of Calgary, became the new leader of the Alberta NDP. We've talked about meeting with Premier Smith and Minister McIver. Have you, or are you going to be reaching out as the uh, Alberta municipalities to have a sit down conversation? conversation with the new incoming quote unquote leader of the official opposition. Tyler? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've had the opportunity to speak with uh, Nahed Menchi a few times leading up to the leadership race. I haven't talked to him since. I sent him a message of congratulations, but I'm sure he's uh, fairly busy over the last few days. But I think it's important to have a relationship with government period, whether it's federal or provincial, the governing party or the opposition. It's really important to have those relationships and and uh, it's it's got to be personal too. It can't just be when you need something. 
So for sure, we'll be reaching out and uh, sending a congratu congratulatory letter to uh, the new leader of the NDP party. Uh, I did unofficially send my thanks to uh, Rachel Notley as well and thank her for all the hard work she's done over the last few years as the party leader. Um, we, uh, yeah, I think it's it's great to have that relationship with everybody. I'd like to have, I'd like to say that I have the same relationship with the UCP government as well. I know a number of ministers um, I can reach out to at any time and and get a response from them too. So yeah, that's a big part of our relationship building and how we're going to represent our members. Um, I, want, I want both of you to answer this next question and we're going to start with Mayor Jones. Uh, Alberta Municipalities is uh, losing a big name in your organization with Dan Rood ending his uh, term as executive director at the end of this year. What does that mean for your organization? And then Trina, and then we'll throw it over to Tyler. But for you, what did Dan mean to Alberta Municipalities and uh, uh, Trina? <laughs> <laughs> Dan, go, there, there's going to be some big shoes to fill. He's been such a huge piece of our organization for 20 years now. And he's passionate. He's caring. He loves our towns. He loves the organization. He loves the staff. And I think finding somebody to fill those shoes is going to be it's going to be almost impossible he, you know he's a unicorn um it's, it's, we've got we've got some plans in place but i think it's going to be for me personally it's going to be a loss for me because he, he's been not just a, a our ceo but he's become a friend and i re will really miss him but you know so many congratulations but sad he's leaving mm -hmm. dialer for yourself same thing. He's been the only CEO I've known through Alberta Municipalities. He's been the CEO for seven years now. Um, he's been tremendous. I've I've really enjoyed working with him, learning from him, seeing how an individual can be so smart and so in touch with the business side and yet still have that political acumen and be able to do that advocacy work as well. Uh, like Trina said, he's a unicorn in terms of his skills and his skill set. It is going to be tough to replace that for sure. Uh, Dan's built an incredible team with his uh, chief executive officers, with the rest of the staff that works there. I think Dan said when he started 20 years ago, there was about 15 or 20 staff, and now they're up over 120 staff. So he's he's been a part of quite a team build there. And I know that his executive officers are absolutely amazing as well. And so being able to help fill that void that when Dan goes and that corporate knowledge is going to be key to whoever that next CA, CEO is uh, for their success. But we as a board want to make sure that they're set up with every bit of success planning moving forward. Uh, we are definitely working on that, on that recruitment. We've uh, hired a couple of consultants that are going to help us through this process and see what happens. I know there are some amazing people across the country even North America wide that uh, Alberta municipalities has a really good reputation. And I think anybody else would be lucky to be the CEO of our association. So I'm looking forward to the process and I'm really sad. I'm going to miss Dan and, and the work and the contributions he's made to the association as well. My last question for both of you, because we're always about what's next, what's coming up for yourself, uh, Mayor Jones, what do you have in store for the summer? Because the work of municipalities don't get a summer off like the provincial or federal government. Your job still continues on. Alberta municipalities work continues on for their uh, fall convention later on this year in Red Deer. But for you, what are you planning on doing? Uh, well, uh, as I've talked about before, and you know, I sound like a broken record, this arena is has consumed my life for the last four years. But I'm happy to say that we are uh, destroying it in two weeks <laughs> and then the rebuild starts and, but that's going to, that is going to consume my summer and hopefully I get to run away for a weekend or two, but you know, that the arena first and then the rest of the work with Alberta municipalities, it's going to be a busy couple months. <laughs> and for yourself, Tyler, as president of Alberta municipalities and mayor of the great city of Wetaskiwin, what do you have on the agenda for the summer? I've got, uh, we'll still do some member visits. I, I love reaching out and heading out and visiting other communities. Uh, we've still got uh, two MLCs left, one down in Sterling and one in Innisfil. So I'm really looking forward to that. 
Uh, I am going to take a couple of weeks off and my family and I are going to head out to the island and do some camping. So I'm really looking forward to that. Our new wastewater treatment facility is just about ready to go. That's been a huge project here in Wetaskiwin. It was about a $54 million build, including some upgrades to the current uh, water infrastructure. We've been super fortunate to receive some grant funding from the provincial government uh, in three different streams, pardon the pun. Um, we had a $12.6, $4 million uh, initially. And then uh, we were just awarded a twelve or a seventeen point nine million dollar grant as well. So that's going to make a huge difference on our utility rates for our residents. So definitely grateful for that. Um, our homeless shelter uh, is continuing its build. It's been a uh, it's been interesting for sure. Learning lots about that. Learning lots about processes. And um, again, it's. It's easy to think short term and and think about what the impact might be in a community uh, immediately. And it's another thing to look long term, 20 years down the road and what those changes are going to make. And I'm really hoping that over my last almost seven years as being mayor, 25, 30 years from now, uh, Wetaskiwin is going to be a better place. And I'm going to continue that work as long as I have the opportunity to. So. That's what I'm going to be working on this summer. And again, trying to get some downtime and some family time is going to be one of my priorities. Well, if you ever want to have a good conversation with a fellow mayor about water, go talk to the mayor of Tofino, British Columbia, because oh. he has an abundance of things to talk about when it comes to water and water management. There's my. I might look them up when I'm out there. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Tyler, Trina, thank you both for doing this. Always a pleasure to sit down with you and talk about Alberta municipals issues and uh, municipalities in general. It's greatly appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Thanks for having us again. Thanks so much for tuning in for another great episode of Municipal Affairs. This episode of Municipal Affairs wouldn't have been possible without the partnership of Alberta Municipalities. Before you go, be sure to hit that subscribe button now and stay in the loop with all our great content covering everything from Municipal Affairs from coast to coast to coast. We're your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well informed as well as engaged. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking.